you, Rabbi. Okay, very good. Moving on. Uh, someone asked this question. I believe it was last week or the week before. Um, they're they're in a mixed mixed uh, community of uh, I guess you could say Christians and Messianics and Jews, and they're getting a lot of uh, uh, I guess you could say negative negative feed from the Christians and Messianics and how the Jews look down upon Gentiles. And so this person is actually wondering how how does Judaism view um, a righteous Gentile, someone who says, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to convert, but I do want to serve Hashem as I am. How does Jews do, 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 uh, do the rabbis, does Judaism view that type of a person uh, as an equal? Do they look at them like, well, these guys are really not that serious. Otherwise they would convert. I mean, ha, what's the view on that? This is uh, more than one right. people, uh, more than one person is curious about this. I'm certain. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I was born in 1960, so if you'd have told me in 1975 there were Gentiles like that, I'd go, really? There are, there are Gentiles who don't want to kill me? You told me that like when I was a kid, because <laughs> I spent my entire childhood in Brooklyn uh, running from Gentiles who wanted to kill me for killing Jesus. Mm. I'm not kidding. So I thought that basically, I mean, this is maybe just a New York thing, but because, you know, the... the uh, there was the Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn. If you grew up in Brooklyn, you know what I'm talking about. And there was, then there was the Italian, Irish, like the Catholic neighborhood. There was a black neighborhood. There was a Hispanic. And just, you just didn't cross the boundaries. And, and there was a lot of tension. And it just, people didn't mix it up very much. It was, there was, so in that world, I bet really the rice gen cells out there, I, I, you know, I'm basically just trying to make sure I don't walk on the wrong side of the street. That where that's where my mind was as a youngster, very influenced, of course, by, you know, growing up with Holocaust survivors as a child, you know. So you know, I, you know, remember, I'm I I was born 15 years after the Holocaust, so I'm growing up with the those who just survived this. That's my world. So I'm thinking as a kid, those are the only Gentiles out there, and then of course we knew that there were like a few, like incredible Gentiles who saved Jews during all it was who numbered in, 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 uh, in a handful. But m my life has changed. My view of the non-Jewish world changed. But Judaism never changed. That, that's just cultural. In the time I was born, where I grew up, so that's cultural. It, it, the, this person is asking a much deeper uh, question. That is, how does Judaism view uh, right Gentiles? We love you. We love you. We adore you. You know, you bring us so much joy because when we encounter righteous Gentile, it brings us such ecstatic ha happiness, simcha to our lives, because that's why the Jewish people were brought to this world. Why is God, what, for what purpose were we chosen? Were we chosen uh, for, uh, to possess wealth and, and to carry in our possessions and no, we we, cho we were chosen. You know, we were chosen to never go through tough times. No, we we've not. We were chosen to be an orla goyim, a light to the nations. Mm -hmm. That's our our purpose for why we exist. We are here for you, and therefore, when Gentile, the, we, first of all, I want you to know another thing. We didn't come up with that word Gentile. <laughs> you Gentiles did. I'm kidding around <laughs> with you, but that's a Gentile word. That's a Gaiusha word. It's Gentile is not a Jewish word. We don't have such a word. Okay. The Jews are also called a goy, a nation. Okay. Before you go yeah. too far, explain to the ones who are unaware of what's going on. What is a righteous Gentile in Judaism? A righteous Gentile is a, a again, it, it's not a, it's a, the word do not have a word for Gentile. That is a Gentile word. That's a word that, uh, you know, it's a, a reverse engineered word that comes really from a Christian concept of how Jews, it's an overlay on us from the church. Mm. But it, it is a, 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 a person who is a righteous among the nations of the world. These are the righteous of the nations of the world. The word am means nation. The word guy also means nation. This slightly different inference, but the key point is the Jewish people are called an Am, are called a Goy, we all are. So the key point is it brings us the greatest joy 
when we encounter a, a righteous Gentile. And I'll, I'll share this just per personally with you. Uh, I, I remember seeing the film Schindler's List mm -hmm. from quite a number of years ago when it came out. And, um, and I was teaching at the time at, um, at Binghamton University, which is like slightly upstate New York. You have to like go along 17 if you're going with New York State and go up 81 a little bit. Anyway, so it's from New York City to Binghamton, New York. I forget what it is. So let's say it's like 185 miles. Like people don't realize how big the state of New York is. It's mm. actually huge, but it's not as big as Texas. So all you guys think is don't get nervous. <laughs> okay. You'll be all right. <laughs> not as big as Texas. All right. Okay. Okay. We got it. All right. Anyway, so I allowed for, you know, I'm teaching at Binghamton, so I allowed a lot of extra time. And I got there so early that I was able to see the film, Schindler's List. So I went to the local movie theater and I watched it. When it, as it, when it came out, and I, I, I remember I wept so much. I was just like, I wasn't crying. I was like, just like, like I don't know, like I stood in the shower, just pouring out of my eyes. Mm. Now, I want to share this point with you. The reason why this uh, film about Oscar Schindler uh, who saved well over a thousand Jews during the Holocaust. The reason why the, the story of this individual is so attractive, is so appealing, is so powerful, is because he wasn't Jewish. Mm. If he had, if Oscar Schindler had been a Jew, it wouldn't be interesting to us. We love, that means the fact that he wasn't Jewish, and in fact, you know, the film was brilliantly shot in black and white. And I can say to this, I, I've know, I, a number of survivors have told me that this, if you want to get some idea of what Auschwitz was like, like this film, in fact, there were a number of survivors who were part of, you know, trying to convey some sense of what, the, whatever, if it can be done, it was, it was so, um, what made it so powerful is, here's Auschwitz Schindler, who's a German, he's a member of the Nazi party, he joined the Nazi party not because of, he has any ideology, uh, but he wants to exploit the war. He wants to make money off the war. And he makes a lot of money, suitcase full. So he was a womanizer and he was making a ton of money off the war. He, but there was a transition in, in, in his life. And I think that Steven Spielberg, by using that little girl who's had the red dress, he sees her alive and then sees her dead. And that's, the, that's that one, one of the few things that are in color. And he uses the color uh, very sparingly in that film to highlight, to italicize, to illuminate, that he goes through a transition where he then gives everything away, all his money to save Jews, paying off Nazis. That's what's attractive to us. That's why it's appealing. The, f the film is such an important story to us. It's because Oscar Schindler was not a Jew. It's because he was a righteous among the nations of the world. The reason why people who think that Jews don't look down at people who are not Jewish is because this is the stench of the church. I, I, if you're a Christian, I don't mean that offensively. You're going, how could you not mean that offensively? But I need to explain this part. And that is, that is how the church conveys what Jews think about non-Jews. And, and that's, that's what it feels. So therefore, they think we look down on them, upon them because they're, church, they're, they're taught this like, the idea that they are second class citizens. The, you even find this idea in the Gospels. Absolutely. Where, mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the Gospels, the where you have, this is told in the Synoptic Gospels, where a woman who's not Jewish comes to Jesus. It's the, what exactly is her origin is disputed, whether she's a Canaanite woman. It's not important. But she comes to, the story is in the Synoptics. We are told it's, uh, of a woman who comes to Jesus whose daughter is vexed with the devil, whatever that means, okay? Right. Kids, kids 
uh, uh, in a lot of trouble, sick. Sight is a schizophrenic, whatever that would have meant at the time. And, and, and Jesus first admonishes her and said, it is not right. In the old King James, it does not meet. We don't use that kind of word anymore, not for that. It is not appropriate to give, take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Right, right. So that means that means that uh, you're a dog. You'll never find a passage like that in Jewish scripture. Never find a piece of filth. Like when Jews read that trash, I'm sorry. I, I, when Jews read that kind of filth in the Christian Bible that uh, portrays Gentiles as dogs, second class citizens, we find that so revolting. That's more disgusting to us than the doctrine of the Trinity and, you know, you know the immaculate conception combined doesn't I mean, that doesn't that's dead. like you want to kick a jew in the stomach i'm not kidding you know just tell a jew that story that's the story that makes yeah. us not and i'm not the spokesman for the jewish people but i want to finish that's the stuff that's so ugly to us we find it so disgusting we find it so you know right now in, in by um in where there's been a, a terrible earthquake and thousands of people have perished in this earthquake. We're, we're in the area of the Himalayas and so on. You know, Israel is like sh shedding mm. planes there to rescue these people because time right now, there are people right now who are underneath rubble, who are still alive and have a pocket of air that they are breathing and they're running out of oxygen really fast. The time is of essence to reach those who survived this, 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 um, this 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 terrible earthquake where unfortunately uh, India sort of marches into the into the Asian continent at the rate of about two inches a year and it, it creates this kind of this tectonic movement uh, well whatever we're gonna get but it's the Jews that are running there we're running everywhere can we say this stuff is that's where this comes from now the story we're told in, in the in this thought this story didn't happen, never happened, no, you know, whatever. But let's just set that aside. So Jesus then says, we don't give, you know, the children's bread to dogs. What that means is very clear. You're just a dog. You're just a Gentile. You're just a low nothing. Now, the church teaches that this is the status of the non-Jew prior to the cross. That's very important. You could read any commentary, Christian commentary on these passages, I don't care where you get it from. It could be Matthew, Henry, Ryrie, Pickett, whatever you want, Calvin. And all of prior to the cross, the status of the non-Jew was low. You're basically nothing more than dog. She then responds to Jesus and says, so Jesus says, no, sorry, you're not Jewish. You don't get the blessings. He says, but yes, do not dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table? And then... The story is, I mean, these, these anecdotes are so powerful. So Jesus then, we are told, respond, oh, you get it, you know, surely. And then he heals the daughter. Well, that is what is poisoning these people. That's why these beautiful people think that we, like, look at them as dogs. We don't. Now, it is true that, yeah, if you, you know, if, if you're a Jew, you know, who grew up, in, somehow you manage you know, you survive, you grew up in Vilna, you grew up in Lithuania, where everybody just wanted to kill you, and then they finally killed your entire family. Yeah, you're going to pretty much think, if you were a Jew living in the, um, in, on the Pale Settlement, means in the western part of the Russian Empire, and all you had around you is the Russian Orthodox Church in Tsarist Russia, you're not meeting a normal person, you know, so in that peasant life, you... You would think that these people just all want to kill us. But that's not theological. That's sociological. That obviously is going to affect people. This is not a part of Tanakh at all. Our purpose is to be, read Isaiah 49, verse 6. Read Isaiah, read Isaiah 43. Read these, these epic passages. Our role in the world is to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the nations, excuse me, to bring the light to the world. So we love that. And if you're out there, and you love the God of Israel. I want you to know that we love you. We're not going to let go of you. We're going to be right there with you. So this idea is, this, unfortunately, it's like, you know, you walk into a room that people are smoking in, right? Sure. You don't smoke, 
but you, everybody is smoking and you spend a few hours in there. You come out, you, you, you stink like tobacco. And that's what, that's what this is. This is that smell that people bring with them after they've left the church. Mm-hmm. And it's the stench. And I'm, I'm using very strong language because this is like, this is the kind of stuff that's so offensive. It, it really, all we want to see. Now, if a person who is not of the Jewish people feels a calling toward the Jewish people, they may feel that they don't feel compelled to be, convert to Judaism. And they should not. I mean, I mean, they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't convert to Judaism. They don't feel so compelled. They should, a person should be a righteous, should be righteous among the nations and observe the seven Noah laws. And you can look that up. There's an enormous amount of literature on that. It's a separate question. There are some people who feel this just very compelled to be Jewish. They just, it's not their, they, they're obligated, they just feel. So I would say two things to you. Number one, check your genealogy. Research your mother's matrilineal biological genealogy. I would do that uh, really fast. And I would go on a website like jewishgen, G-E-N dot org. Uh, and research your genealogy, maybe hire a genealogist, you might very well find out you are Jewish, or you may want to then consider converting to Judaism if you feel compelled to do that. That's your decision. If you feel compelled to convert to Judaism, it's your job to, to move ahead with that. The rabbi will want to slow you down. That's his job. That's not your business. Your job from your end is to move ahead with that process and if you feel so cold, if you mm-hmm. feel so so strongly pulled towards the children of Israel, because you may be the son of the strangers, the B'nai Necha that's discussed in Isaiah 56. That is, yeah. uh, there are many Jews who just were uh, got baptized, were forced to convert for whatever reason. They were fleeing something with someone, and they kept it a secret. And now it's five generations later, and people now are strangers. They're really a part of the Jewish people. They don't know it. Yeah. You know, we, we had a Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. She, during her, she claims, I'll take a word for her, that she discovered during her tenure when she was serving as a secretary that she discovered that she was Jewish. And there was a, uh, just a lot of folks like that. Um, mm-hmm. A senator from Virginia, Allen, I forget his name, uh, discovered that. Jewish as adults, and people just find out. My my great grandparents didn't want to say anything because they wanted to make sure we survived or or were accepted. Okay. So there's yes, of course. That's to a Jew, that's uh, nothing more appealing than watch a person of the nations rise up. Very good. Now, how are you doing? Where are you calling from? Can you hear us? Again, some- this is Rivka. Oh, hill. hi, Rivka. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Hey. Um. I, I've been listening to the rabbi uh, talk, and he was talking about the uh, Gentiles. And uh, a scripture that, or at least the scripture that comes to my mind, is about Abraham being the father of many nations. Is that mm, that's a good point? Because people from the nations will join the Jewish people, or is that actually seed from the male? Uh, descendants of Abraham that mixed with the nations. I, I myself am, am a, a, a descendant of many Jews. Well, at least it, when I looked back into my genealogy, I have many Jews that came from Spain into Mexico. But when we, it, it's all on my mother's side uh, far right now is what we found, but there it's on the male side of my mother's side. When we did a DNA testing, my mother's testing did not test out as uh, Ashkenazic Jew. Uh, she was a haplo group A, and but we have um, a male um, descendant who did, he's our cousin who did a um, DNA and he did have Ashkenazi but he doesn't have uh, his genealogy cliff on his mother's side but his genealogy connects with ours up on our male side but I was because we there are many of my family members who have this infinity to 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 draw close to Judaism 
but yet our DNA shows something different. So I was kind of wondering about this whole holy seed that I've read about. I don't know what your thoughts about that, Rabbi. If oh. you, I'm trying to sort out my questions in the sense that I didn't know if this these descendants of the if Abraham is going to be a father of many nations. Are these the Zera of the male descendants of Abraham, or are they converts coming mm. from the nations? I don't know. Is it, is great, matter? great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, Rivka. Rivka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. So, uh, Rivka is very clearly uh, speaking of a promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter seventeen. Uh, Abraham himself was not a Jew. That's a, a misnomer. If Abraham and his wife were Jewish, then everybody. Mm -hmm. would be sent of them would be Jews. And that, of course, is not the case. Uh, Abraham was a Mesopotamian. The, the, the royal family, and I don't mean this in a pedestrian sense, but the, the, the family that God will work through to produce the nation that would represent God on earth for the nations of the world, to be the light, that's what the whole book of Genesis is about. It's about we producing that nation that God can work with, not the lucky ones who win the lottery necessarily, but the ones who are God's firstborn son. And what that means is that the ones who would have what it takes and the resilience and to be able to reflect back to the world, God, so people would know how to worship God properly. That's what's happening throughout Isn't the book God of Genesis, is yeah. that family is being created. now. Abraham was, in fact, the father of many different nations, not only the Jews, but also those people who are not Jewish. And that's what's conveyed in Genesis chapter 17, verse 4, 5, and 6, and so on. And we're going to see that come up quite a bit in, in the Bible, uh, mm -hmm. particularly here in Genesis 22. The key point is that I want to talk about the, the DNA part. The DNA... Is 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 not first of all. In Jewish law has no has no halachic implications whatsoever. Um, DNA is useful only as a positive. There is the negative part is of no use whatsoever, and it has no implications in Jewish law at all. Just so you know, that means you. And when I say you, the listener may. may can do a DNA test that may tell you, give you a lot of information about your family, but in to a, to a to a Jewish court, which would perform a conversion or would assert that you are Jewish, or for Jewish identity, it just has no um, it has no weight in that area. It's it's a indicator if you got you know the, uh, the all this information that's blowing out. Of course, that tells you. Wow, so you know that's a meter that will tell you to start doing the genealogical checks to find the tombstones, to find the marriage because those are things that will clearly identify you as a Jew. Uh, the estimates are that about seventy percent it runs around the place, but about seventy percent of Spaniards or people from Spain have Jewish blood. I mean, the numbers are so high because, as many of you know, in, in, uh, in August of 1492, uh, the Jews were expelled from Spain at the order of Ferdinand and Isabella, may their memory and their name perish. And the Jews moved on, and they moved on anywhere they, they fled. Not all the Jews, some stayed and got baptized. But many again, the number, the the information is is this is a very well recorded event. But exactly the exact extent of the numbers, we're talking many, many, many hundreds of thousands of Jews fled, and they many of them went to Portugal as an example. Only four years later to be expelled from Portugal, some went on to Western Europe. Many went on to Turkey. Some went on to Italy. People. The Jews fled. They fled for their lives with, with their faith with them. 
And some of them went into hiding as Muranos, which means that they got baptized, they could not, for whatever reason, give up everything they had. Outwardly, they're inverted messianic Jews, which means that they outwardly behaved as a Christian, they got baptized to survive, and privately and secretly lived as Jews. The exact opposite of the messianic movement, which outwardly seeks to appear Jewish, but inwardly is completely Christian. It's ex reciprocal mm. of, of, of what is called messianic. So all their descendants, there are no doubt hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these people who come from you know, the Spanish world. Ashkenazi, that, that term generally conveys uh, someone of German uh, Jewish descent as opposed to Sephardi. And then there'll be another term that you're going to see kicked around, but not used as much as it should be, and that is Mizrahi, those of the East, those are the sons of Jews who come from the lands that are uh, in, the, in the Arab world. We're talking about huge, huge numbers of Jews uh, who are coming from the East, uh, the, you know, from the Middle East and so on. So, so therefore, uh, numbers are very, very high. DNA is a great personal indicator for you just to get an idea. It has no unlocking bearing. It's, it has no bearing in God's eyes. There are no doubt millions of people today who, who are Jewish and don't know it. So they're imposter uh, Gentiles. <laughs> wow, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> that means they're, yeah. What they're, a concept. They're walking around saying, I'm not Jewish, but they really are. There are millions of these people because all these Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity, well, what did they do? They, they, they had babies, you know, like, and their children had children, and their children are all here among us. Mm. And there's really good reason to keep your mouth shut about your Jewish identity if you were uh, in Europe, because the, that's the, being Jewish was not the way you would win a popularity contest. That's the way you get yourself, even the accusation of Jewish ancestry, which was routinely made against people who were not Jew. I mean, you know, people who just didn't like you, they said that you had, you had Jewish ancestry and that ruined your political career. We see that happening right now in South America where people running for office in Venezuela or in Chile, and they're, they're just their opponents let out this thing that this person is really Jewish. This happens all the time. And that's, there's so much anti-Semitism in these countries where Roman Catholicism is so dominant. And it's kind of a very, it's not like Roman Catholic, Rudy Giuliani, Roman Catholic. Forget that. In South America, Roman Catholicism is very um, old world Roman Catholic. Hmm. Jew is not like, you know, you know if you're in Sao Paulo and someone screams Jew, um, they're not doing it because they're as a compliment. They're not saying that you make great chicken soup. It's probably, if you're in, 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 in Venezuela, it probably is something else is being conveyed. And, you know, it's just, can't go into now, but these are not countries that, these are countries that a lot of raw anti-Semitism is very much in vogue. It is not in the, there's, there's, there are plenty of anti-Semites in America, but um, apparently no one admits to it uh, sure. because it's not socially <laughs> right. acceptable. Sure. So, you know, even David Duke, he's not an anti-Semite, he just hates Jews. So, but in Venezuela, that's like, uh, you know, that's like, you know, right. hating Jews is like a national pastime today. And the Jews are on the run in the, these countries. Jews are on the run in Central and South America and Costa Rica. Big problems, very big problems. So mm -hmm. uh, to make the point is, what you want to do is research. I would encourage, it's not that expensive to, if you have a sense of where your family comes from, I would advise you to ask questions of family members without telling them why you're going to ask. If you go to your great aunt and ask her, I'm thinking of becoming a Jew or I want to be Jewish. Do we, do we have Jews in our family? You're probably going to have, get a shutdown response, which mm -hmm. means you're not going to get information. So you don't want to do that. What you do want to is, in, you know, in conversation, just ask, I don't know how to do it because I don't know your family, but 
you may not want to convey that sure. when you're asking the question. But then what happens all the time is they just don't want to talk about it. Get as, so what you want to do is assemble as much information as possible. Information for a genealogist is, is the currency. They need uh, cities, they need towns. They've got microfilm. They've got the stuff at their fingertips. The baptismal certificates, you know, especially you're talking about Europe. You're talking about, you know, this stuff is recorded. This is not like the Congo, you know, where, you know, sure. this is, these are places where people recorded information. And then there are genealogists, which you can find on that site. It's not that expensive because they've got, it's not like they're running around some cemetery looking for you. They've got the records mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll scour it and find that for you. And that's the kind of stuff you want to look for. So. Awesome. But yeah, there's high numbers of Jews in Mexico and South America. And so and that on. is Jew Gen, J E W G E N. Jew, um, Jewish Gen. Jewish Gen. Got it. G E N as in genetics. Okay. Very good. Very good. Dot awesome. org. Dot org. Okay. Jewish Gen dot org. Perfect. 